I wash my hands a lot lately. I hope you do too. It's one of the simple things we can do to reduce the spread of the coronavirus. Washing our hands frequently, along with keeping our social distance and wearing a mask, helps reduce the spread of the coronavirus. I'm using one of the new touch-free faucets we've installed at Lord of Life. The touch-free faucets, along with the automatic sliding doors and hand sanitizing stations as you enter the building, help reduce the spread of the virus. While touch may not be a high risk, we're trying to reduce as much as we can. In today's gospel, Jesus talks about clean hands and clean food. Not the type of cleaning we do that washes away the dirt, the germs, and the virus, but ritual cleansing and kosher food. Those acts of worship that help to cleanse the body in mind and soul. Those ritual acts are all good, but they don't in and of themselves clean anything. When I wash my hands, the soap, the water, and the friction actually rubs away the dirt. But how do I cleanse my body on the inside? How do I have a clean heart? Jesus said, it's not what goes into one's mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out. And I know that what comes out of my mouth is not always clean, it's not always right, and it's not always good. That's why the psalmist says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a right spirit within me. Just as my physical health relies on good hygiene, so my spiritual health relies on God's grace to cleanse me from within. And the diligence on my part to put spiritual growth and health above sickness and stagnation. How do I clean up my act? Where do my thoughts and actions get muddy? Do other people see me as a person who is above reproach? Or do they see me as a person under judgment? That's what the Greek word hypocrisy means, to be under judgment. To say one thing and do another. But let's put other people aside for a moment and do some self-reflection. Every time I wash my hands, I look in the mirror. And I can see more than just my reflection in the mirror. I can actually see into me in the way that others can't. I see into myself in a way that God can. The good news is that God is more forgiving and accepting. God loves me in spite of me. That's grace. The question is, what do I do with that grace? How do I allow God to create a clean heart within me? When I look in the mirror, I also see another thing. I see a person created in God's image. Not perfect, but God's child nonetheless. Just like every other person on the face of the earth. That's something to think about the next time you wash your hands and look in the mirror. Welcome to Lord of Life. Welcome to worship. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Let us pray. God of all peoples, your arms reach out to embrace all those who call upon you. Teach us as disciples of your Son to love the world with compassion and constancy, that your name may be known throughout the earth through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them. What comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. The disciples came to him and asked, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? Jesus replied, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them, they are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Peter said, explain the parable to us. Are you still so dull, Jesus asked them? Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, 
and these defile them. Out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person. But eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, she keeps disturbing us. Jesus answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him, Lord, help me, she said. Jesus replied, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. But Lord, she replied, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Jesus said, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. Today's gospel is disturbing. In fact, it might be one of the most disturbing stories in the Christian gospel because it shows a side of Jesus that doesn't look so Christian. Jesus has been teaching about the heart of worship, not the surface issues. He's not criticizing the kosher laws and ritual practices per se, but he is critical of people who put external practices before internal attitudes. It's not what goes in, it's what comes out of your mouth that defiles, because that comes from your heart. In other words, Jesus is talking about hypocrisy, and we all know something about hypocrisy. A colleague once told me that he invited someone to church. I don't go to church, the person replied, because the church is full of hypocrites. Come anyway, he said, we can always use one more. The church is full of hypocrites and liars, cheaters, and downright no good sinners. The only qualification for joining a church is that you don't deserve to belong. Right after Jesus talks about hypocrisy, he crosses the border into foreign soil. Tyre and Sidon are in Lebanon south of Beirut, the city that was rocked last week by the explosion. A Canaanite woman asks for his help. Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. Jesus says nothing. That is disturbing. She persists and the disciples tell him, get rid of her, she's bothering us even more disturbing. Jesus tells her, I was sent to help my people, not your people, Israel, not foreigners. Yet she persists. She kneels before him and pleads, Lord, help me. That's most disturbing at all. At this point in the exchange, you would think that Jesus would welcome her, answer her, and at least acknowledge her. That would be the Christian thing to do. But that's not what Jesus does. Instead, he says, it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Is that what she is? Is that all she is, a dog, not even a person? Just because she is a foreigner, does that make her any less important a person or inferior in God's eyes? And what does this say about Jesus, whose words don't match his actions? That's the textbook definition of a hypocrite, and that is disturbing. And because he says this to a foreign woman, we have to ask the question, is Jesus biased? Does he discriminate her against her based on gender, race, or creed? I told you at the outset this gospel is disturbing. 
It shows a side of Jesus that doesn't look so Christian, where he draws a line between his race and others. What does it mean to be a racist? That's a question we're asking today, isn't it? Am I racist? 55 years after the Civil Rights Act, what does it mean to be racist? Most of us are of an age that we can remember the signs that read, whites only, Negroes moved to the back of the bus. Even dogs got higher billing than people of color. And if it's not the color that separate, separates us, then it's the country or the language or the religion. We are all old enough to remember when racism was right out there in the open, when people could be good Christians on Sunday and different on Monday. And it was accepted in white society because there was a place for everything as long as everybody knew their place. The problem is that racism is like a virus that survives and thrives when it's given any opportunity. It's a pandemic that is always active in our world. I can't be racist. I have friends who are black. My doctor is from India. We vacation in Mexico. How can I possibly be racist? And it is true, things have changed in our lifetimes. Our kids go to the same schools. That is, unless you live in a different part of town or choose to send your kids to a private school. We can worship together. And yet Sunday morning is still one of the most segregated times in America. We sit on the bus together, that is, if you take the bus, I choose to drive. And, and speaking of driving, Stanford University studied 100 million traffic stops over six years in 21 states. Police stopped and searched black and Latino drivers on the basis of less evidence than used in stopping white drivers who are searched less often but are more likely to be found with illegal items. Along with DWI, every person of color also knows the acronym DWB, driving while black. We're beginning to understand that racism is not just obvious intentional discrimination, it's also the built-in bias that many of us have and the ways that society systematically favors some people over others. In today's gospel, Jesus appears to be biased against this foreign woman. When she asks for help, he says, it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Does that sound harsh to you? I think it does. But consider the morning prayer that every Jewish man would say, Blessed are you, O God, King of the universe, who has not made me a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. And now a Gentile woman confronts Jesus with a very different reality. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Until someone stands up and says, This isn't fair, Nothing changes. Why do we create an economy where some have all that they need and more, while others have to eke out a life from what trickles down from the table? Why does it take a Canaanite woman to remind us of what's right? Or a Rosa Parks to remind us of what's wrong? Why does Lady Liberty welcome some people who are yearning to breathe free while others aren't welcome, and some others simply can't breathe. I don't know what Jesus was thinking at the time. Did the woman change his mind? Or did he use this encounter as a teachable moment for the disciples? Was this his way of teaching them to examine their own biases and assumptions? Scholars think that when Paul wrote to the church in Galatia, he had this morning prayer in mind. So instead of thanking God for not being born a Gentile, a slave, or a woman,
Paul proclaimed that there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male or female, we are all the same in Christ Jesus. I don't know what Jesus was thinking. What I do know is that Jesus gave her what she asked for, and it wasn't the leftover crumbs. Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. That's kind of a passive way of saying what the Message Bible translates as, oh woman, your faith is something else. What you want is what you get. And right then and there, her daughter became well. And then Matthew writes, Jesus left that place and went along the Sea of Galilee. Then he went up on a mountainside and sat down, and great crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and laid them at his feet, and he healed them. No one is turned away. All are welcome. And when he realizes they are hungry, he takes some bread and fish and feeds them, just as he did before, not scraps or leftovers, not crumbs that trickled down. The gospel says that all ate and were satisfied. Thousands of men, women, and children. This world isn't a perfect place. Life isn't fair. You know it. I know it. God knows it. But sometimes God puts people in our lives to trouble us. As the late John Lewis would say, to give us good trouble. To show us our hypocrisy and challenge our attitudes. To change us. To remind us that we are part of a beloved community where all are welcome, loved, and accepted. Amen.
Let us proclaim together our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our response this day to the prayers of intercession is hear our prayer. Confident of your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Lord, you gather the church to be part of your mission as ambassadors of Christ. As Jesus acknowledged the great faith of a woman from outside his people, help your church discover and find blessing in the faith of people we might reject. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You have blessed us with the bounty of the earth. Grant your grace to all creatures so the earth will flourish. Relieve waters choked by pollution, renew soils stripped of nutrients, and make safe the air that all creatures need to live. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You call the nations to be glad and sing for joy. Let your way be known among all the nations of the world, now divided by competing interests and contending alliances and consumed by enormous worry. We pray this day for the recovery efforts in Beirut and for the, those who have suffered loss and death. We pray also for relief in the wake of floods in India. Bless us. Make your face shine upon all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You show unexpected mercy, kindness, and generosity. We pray for those who do not have enough for outcasts in our social structures, and for those who need your healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In you we live and move and have our being. Grant us, your people, at Lord of Life Lutheran Church, grace to find our lives refreshed in you. Send your grace to refresh the community of Peace Lutheran Church in Peoria, and bless their ministry and pastor, Al Cassell. Give us rest and renewal, and strengthen us for mission in your name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your eternal promises are more than we could ever imagine. As you gather all the saints, join us also with them on the great day of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, you have brought us this far along the way. In times of bitterness, you do not abandon us, but guided us into the path of love and light. In every age, you sent prophets to make known your loving will for all humanity. The cry of the poor has become your own cry. Our hunger and thirst for justice is your own desire. In the fullness of time, you sent your chosen servant to preach good news to the afflicted, to break bread with the outcast and despised, and to ransom those in bondage to prejudice and sin. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He blessed it and broke it and gave it for all to eat and said, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine and after giving thanks, gave it for all to drink and said, this is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Remembering therefore his death and resurrection, we await the day when Jesus shall return to free all the earth from the bonds of slavery and death. Come Lord Jesus and let the church say amen, amen. Send your Holy Spirit, our advocate, to fill the hearts of all who share this bread and cup with courage and wisdom to pursue love and justice in all the world. Come, Spirit of Freedom, and let the church say amen, amen. Join our prayers and praise with your prophets and martyrs of every age, that rejoicing in the hope of the resurrection, we might live in the freedom and hope of your Son, through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Let the church say amen. Amen. We pray the prayer as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The bread and wine are ready. Jesus is the host, and we are the guests. It is time for us to share communion one with another. The body of Christ broken for you, and the blood of Christ poured out for you. May the body and blood of our precious Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and to keep you forever in his grace and peace. Amen. Receive the words of the Lord's benediction, that the Lord bless you and keep you, that the Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy, that the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace now and forever. Amen.